should be okay. Yeah, does it look good? Good. Okay. Well, hello and welcome everyone to Discover Physics at SFU. This is something we do a couple of times a year, and it's an opportunity for us to tell you, uh, grade 10, 12 high school students and your parents about uh, what it's like to study physics, why choosing to study physics would likely be a good uh, sound choice if you're thinking about practical methods for your future career, and why studying physics at SFU uh, would make you very happy. So um, today we'll have an introductory talk by me, which is what I'm doing right now followed by a couple of talks by my colleagues who will tell you about some cool research that they're doing in our department. If you have any questions during my presentations or other presentations, it would be best if you type them in the chat and I will monitor the chat and make sure your questions are answered. You could also raise a hand and we will find a good moment to interrupt the presentations and see if you would like it. If you, if you feel like you're being completely ignored, then turn your mic on and shout, okay? So we, we are not afraid of that. So uh, with that, let me start and uh, tell you about what it's like to do physics and what it's, uh, what it's likely to be, uh, to lead you if you did physics and about our department. And pay attention because there will be a quiz at the end, and that will be your chance to win some prizes. The top five scores will get a prize. So pay attention. So just uh, in terms of numbers, we are a medium-sized department compared to other physics departments. In Can Canada, we have about 30 professors, of whom 25 do teaching and research, and five do mostly teaching. Uh, we have about 200 undergraduate physics majors, and a lot of our undergraduate, un uh, undergraduate physicists um, actually do research and do a project before they graduate, and that's what gives them an honors degree. So 33% of students in the Faculty of Science are physics students. 33 of those who do an honors degree are doing the project. So in our department, a lot of our students do research before they graduate. And we also have a good number of grad students who work towards their master's and PhD degrees. We have some uh, variety of streams, we call them programs that you could follow. If you're unsure what flavor of physics you like, you just go for your generic vanilla physics degree, which is called physics bachelor of science. And then you can choose to do just coursework or do a our coursework and the project. If you do a project, then it would be an honors degree. But then we also have more sort of specialized programs which cater to your uh, specific interests. For example, if you're more interested in practical applications of physics, maybe to computer science, engineering, or things like that, you could go for the applied physics program or chemical physics as the name suggests, but educate you at more depth in methods of chemistry, and then you could work at the cross, at the cross uh, section of different fields. Similarly with biological physics. Mathematical physics is a good choice for students who would consider going to graduate school afterwards because it gives them sort of more theoretical uh, knowledge about physics and sets them up for uh, going for their master's and PhD. Now, to give you a taste of the kind of courses you would be likely to take, uh, we would recommend if you are a curious person and you like science, and if you're not afraid of math, not necessarily great at it, but if you're willing to learn, then you could enroll in what we call our enriched stream. So physics 125 is, would be your first course on mechanics and that would include um, some topics on special relativity. It's a smaller class and it's much more fun if you, are, uh, if you like discussions and interactions with your professor. 
Then we have all these other courses that, just to give you a flavor, we have this quantum course. Um, our department is very active in the field of quantum computing, both in making uh, quantum, uh, trying to make a quantum computer as well as developing software and algorithms for that. So that would be your, I guess, first course where you would learn a little bit about that. And similarly, you could learn about biophysics and gravity, black holes, cosmology at at a higher level in in your fourth year. So this looks quite fancy, uh, but hey, Levon, not, yeah, you actually have a question in I the chat. I have a question which I see. I okay. Does applied science program differ from engineering one? Yes, it's different. There is. We also have. Uh, SFU has engineering physics, which is an engineering degree. And we also have an applied science physics major, which is a physics degree. So they are different things. And we can, uh, I hope I answered your question, okay? So I should uh, carry on. Thanks, David. If you see more questions, interrupt me because I can't always see raised hands or chats. Thank you. Sure, no problem. So uh, the point I was trying to make earlier was that um, you learn all this physics, but it's not just about physics. Okay, for example, we have a third year course, which is called Introduction to Observational Astrophysics. And it is about astrophysics and learning how to use telescopes uh, in practice. We have a great telescope on campus and how to analyze astronomical data. But in the process, you learn skills that are universally uh, transferable. You would learn how to use some sophisticated equipment. You would learn how to program, if you didn't know already by then, how to code in Python and analyze that data using some standard data analysis techniques. Um, we have a course on computational physics, which is uh, uh, clearly very broadly applicable because computers now are involved in all walks of life. We have a course on quant computational information science. Again, quantum computing is the next big thing and it would allow uh, applications to such uh, broadly uh, important things like cryptography and uh, etc and quantum algorithms and then not to mention our advanced lab where you can learn to use very sophisticated equipment which is again quite universally useful uh, if you pursue a career in some kind of a technological field later on so uh, this brings me to my sort of main point that with a physics degree, you would be quite well equipped for uh, the modern world, which is rapidly changing. You don't know what would the, the most, most in-demand skills be five to 10 years from now. So you would learn skills like problem solving, which is universally true and universally applicable and problem solving would likely make you stand out in whatever environment you end up working in later on. And uh, there are also some, as you can see, there are skills, uh, communication skills that you learn here, uh, learning how to handle equipment, how to turn ideas into equations, which is a simple way of saying mathematical modeling, <laughs> okay, etc. So, this is just a flavor of what kind of careers our recent graduates had. We had uh, people work for the city as engineers. We, had, we have people working in high-tech companies, uh, entrepreneurs who started businesses. We have a couple of recent graduates who ended up working for space companies. One of them is currently at NASA. A few of our graduates became university professors, etc. You get the flavor of a uh, physics degree not necessarily meaning that you would be, become a teacher or a university researcher or something of that nature. So it's, um, it opens opportunities. So one thing we uh, believe strongly in, in our department and we try to encourage is 
our undergraduate students to get into research as early as possible, because just taking courses is uh, one dimension of your university experience. Research uh, uh, introduces you to the cutting edge, to the front, forefront of science, and uh, teaches you how to explore things and how to think critically. So in our department, we have uh, several research groups, uh, several research teams. We have multiple research groups, but working on sort of this uh, several areas. Two of them you will hear about. So David Brun will talk about condensed metaphysics and his work on superconductors. And uh, David Sivak will talk about so-called soft meta. He works on molecular engines. I'm a particle cosmology person. And uh, you could ask me questions about that if you want later. And then we have other research. As I mentioned, we have a big uh, thing going on with quantum computing right now. The way to get into research for undergrads uh, is through one of these uh, five options, or it could be multiple of these five. Not, you don't have to do one or the other. So a doctor physicist would likely be your first experience getting involved in research. We encourage our first year students to ask to be adopted. That means you join a group, you, you're welcome to attend the group meetings and you get a chance to learn about the research area and to participate, to start participating in research. And that kind of shows you how things are done and informs you uh, of how to uh, proceed with your later research experience. Um, we have a more formal program, that's the university-wide thing called the COP, where you get something like a paid internship. You get to do a project uh, for three terms or work in a company where you paid and that goes on your SFU record as well. So it's a great way to get involved in research or get practical experience working in a company. As I mentioned, we have this observatory uh, and these are examples of pictures taken by, by students at the observatory. So you can tell they're of some amazing quality. Uh, there are other opportunities for, for example, summer research where you can apply and get funded to pay, be paid for four months over the summer to do research at SFU in, and also at other universities in Canada. And uh, finally, uh, there is this honors thesis, which is for required for all students doing an honors degree where you would have to complete a research project. Okay, and uh, the life in a department is quite lively for our undergrads. Uh, their physicists are a fun bunch. They, of course, can be nerdy, but they're also fun people. And there are all kinds of events that are going on. We have a yearly pizza party, which is also the time where you sign up for adoption by different research groups. So we'll have a student panel later on where you can ask them more about student life at SFU. So with that, I'm going to finish and uh, just mention that we've, we have this great question box now uh, that is linked to the page at which you signed up for this event. You can also just uh, copy this link by the way, this talk will be posted online, so you can always watch it again if you missed anything. So submit a question in the box. It has this option for requesting a tour. So we will, uh, if we see a request like that, but we'll, uh, we'll try to accommodate and get you come and visit us and see what it's like in, in person. So with that, I'll stop and see. There is a raised hand. Jacob, is your raised hand still... Um, a valid hand, or is it just the left over? Okay, it disappeared. All right, so if you have any questions about what I said, please type them in the chat and I will try to answer. Uh, with that, I'll pass this to David Sivak, who I will introduce. So David is a one of the professors in a physics department and the Canada Research Chair in the field of statistical biophysics. He works on all kinds of really cool things. He's a theorist, theoretician, and today he'll tell us about his work on molecular machines. Go ahead, David. Okay, 
Thank you, Levon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. And can you see my slides? Yeah. Great. Um, well, uh, everybody, thank you for coming tonight. Um, please feel free to, to drop questions into chat as we go along or to raise your hand or even just interrupt me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to stop along the way. Um, so as Levon said, I'm, I'm also a professor in the physics department. And um, I'm going to tell you tonight about how evolution is an engineer. I'll tell you about the ingenious nanomachines inside all living things. And if you take away nothing else from this little presentation about the kinds of things that I think about in my research, I just want you to realize that nanoscale molecular machines uh, face challenges that are akin to trying to ride a bicycle in a cyclone. Okay, so we'll get there. So uh, let me start with sort of a physicist view of living things. And this really starts from one of the most fundamental laws of, of physics, which is known as the second law of thermodynamics, which I'll try to convince you is relatively inconvenient for living things. So what is the second law of thermodynamics? It says that the entropy, or roughly speaking, the disorder of the universe always increases over time. So this is why if you put wired headphones into your pocket and you forget about them for a couple of days and you pull them out, they're typically tangled. This is why, despite my best efforts, any sort of Lego creations in my house inevitably become a big mess of individual blocks scattered all over my house. But what's very striking is that when you look into the living world, when you look in the biosphere, this very narrow shell of the earth, you actually see incredible order. You don't see disorder everywhere you look. So this is kind of like a high school textbook biology picture of a cell, the basic building block of all living things. And there's incredible structure here. There are things in particular places and not in others. It's not a big mess. If you look at how it dynamically evolves over time, the processes are very orderly. Um, and so how is the living things, despite this second law that says, oh, everything's got to become a mess, how is it that they can actually maintain order um, and, and create it out of, out of disorder? And so as physicists, we, we understand at a very high level how this works. So essentially living things siphon energy off of energy flows. And sort of the, the most primary way in which this occurs, right, is that the sun shines on the earth, the earth absorbs energy from the sun, eventually it re-radiates it out into space. But in the meantime, living things have figured out ways to essentially harness that energy and use that energy to create and maintain order and to create structure and basically, you know, the hallmarks of living things. So at a smaller scale, individual organisms, right? We take in food and we um, give out waste. And along the way, we can siphon energy off of the food as it passes through our bodies to again, create order to maintain the kind of processes we need to stay alive. So the way that living things actually do this at the most fundamental level is that they use what are called molecular machines to convert between different forms of energy to basically siphon energy off of these energy flows that they're surrounded by. So some basic facts about these molecular machines, they're typically nanometers in size. So billionths of a meter across. So these are very, 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 very small objects. They're composed of proteins and we'll get back in a bit to why that's important. And what they do is they convert between all kinds of different forms of energy. So they convert between mechanical energy, the kind that you might store in a spring if you compress it. They convert between mechanical energy and electrical energy, such as you get, we get out of you know, wall sockets, but they find other ways to harness electrical energy and to create it. And they convert between forms of chemical energy as well, analogously to how you know, we make use of chemical energy stored, for example, in gasoline. And so let me tell you a few examples of the, of the wide world of molecular machines that are out there and sort of the, the amazing forms that they take and the functions that they fulfill. So one primary example is photosynthetic machines. So these are the objects that actually do this very first step of harnessing sunlight from the sun. They directly receive energy from the sun in the form of sunlight, they absorb it and they convert it into essentially separating charges across a membrane. So they're basically creating a voltage across a membrane 
what they're doing is they're converting sunlight, light energy into electrical energy, charge separation across, across a surface. And you can really think of them as very analogous to the kinds of human engineered renewable energy in, in, in the form of photovoltaic cells, right? In some sense, we are replicating what nature figured out how to do, uh, you know, million, hundreds and millions of years ago. Another class of these machines is what are known as rotary motors. My favorite machine is called ATP synthase. The names don't really matter, but what this does is that other machinery creates a voltage across a membrane that this machine lies inside. And it takes this electrical energy, this charge separation across the membrane, and it converts it into rotational motion of a crankshaft that's right in the middle of this machine. And that rotation then drives this red part of the machine to make what's called ATP, which is a small chemical molecule that's very stable, but very high energy. So what it's done is it's transformed electrical energy into portable chemical energy. And now living things then take these ATP molecules and they distribute them wherever they need to make some process happen that wouldn't happen naturally. So you can really think of these ATP molecules like batteries. And this, this molecular machine that makes them is really a battery factory. But again, a nanoscale battery factory. Another example of a rotary motor is what's known as the flagellum. This is basically a hair which is embedded in bacteria. And it makes use again of a voltage across a membrane to drive rotation of this hair. And if you zoom out a little bit and look at what's going on, if you rotate this hair, it actually propels the bacterium through the water. So this is how bacteria swim, is by generating rotation of these hairs, which due to their shape and their elasticity, then push the bacteria in particular directions. So this is how they actually move around. So they convert electrical energy into motility, into motion. So you can really think of this as a really close analogy of basically like an outboard motor on a powerboat. And finally, I'll just mention a couple motors that are near and dear to my heart. They're called transport motors. They move things around living things. So one example is kinesin. Here's a little video that an illustrator made to kind of show how it works. It basically walks along filaments. You can think of them as highways within cells, dragging often much larger cargoes behind it. Another similar motor is called myosin that walks along different highways carrying different cargoes. So these are all part of the transport system within living things. And so what these motors are doing is they're converting chemical energy into motion, right? So they really are totally analogous in many ways to the car engine that converts chemical energy stored in gasoline into moving you around. So those are some examples of these machines. And now I want to tell you a little bit about how we as biophysicists think about them and sort of their interesting properties and what makes them really fascinating to study. So let's think a little bit about their size in more detail, right? So I've said some of these motors are analogous to cars. So how big is a car engine? A car engine is roughly a meter in size, give or take, right? I've got to start zooming way down in size to approach these machines. If I go down by a factor of 100, I get to a centimeter in size. That's the typical size of a screw. I zoom in another factor of 100, and I now get to the typical width of human hair. This is now... Uh, let's see here, this is a, a tenth of a millimeter, 100 micrometers. I zoom another factor of 100, I'm now looking at a micron in size, a micrometer, that's the typical size of bacteria. I've got to go another factor of 100 to actually get to the, to the length scale of these molecular machines. So they're kind of like car engines and how they function, but they're 100 million times smaller. And so that leads to really fundamental differences in just physically how they behave and how they're designed as a result. Just a reminder, how big is light, right? The wavelengths of vi visible light are hundreds of nanometers. So these machines are so small, you can't, you can't see them. There is no possible microscope that can image them because they're smaller than the size of light, right? So it's, you actually have to have very ingenious experimental methods to even learn about them in the first place. Let's talk about what they're made of in a little bit more detail. So you can ask how hard or conversely, how floppy is the material that they're made out of? So to give you a tour of some typical materials that we might encounter, maybe not everyday lives, but sometimes, diamond, a very hard material, has what's known as a Young's modulus, just basically a, a, a stiffness of, of, in particular units, one terapascal. Okay, don't worry about the numbers. It's got a particular hardness. 
If I make it 10 times floppier, I get to the typical stiffness of steel, which is a material that's often used in, in, in human engineered machines. I go a factor of 10 more floppy and I get to wood. Another factor of 10 more floppy and I get to typical plastics like that make up your milk jug. And even another 10 more floppy, I get to rubber. And so the key point here is that the proteins that make up molecular machines, they're typically in this range of sort of soft plastic to rubber. So you're, you're, you're making machines that do similar things to maybe your car engine, but you're engineering, you're designing them with things that are 100 to 1,000 times floppier than what humans typically engineer out of. So it's this really interesting challenge that nature has figured out. How can you make machines that do anything at all with something that's, you know, like Play-Doh? That's a really interesting design problem that nature faces. As a result, because they're so small, because they're so floppy, they're constantly jittering, right? These things don't just sit still and then make orderly movements. They're constantly bouncing all over the place. You can see this in even much larger objects. These are things that are, <clears throat> excuse me, a hundred times bigger than these molecular machines. These are tiny microscopic pollen grains, but they're big enough we can actually see them in a microscope. And when you watch them, they're always bouncing around. And the reason why is because they're so small that actually collisions with individual water molecules are sometimes so forceful on the scale of these tiny little pollen grains that they actually get you know, jolted somewhere else, right? So all these little jittering motions are because they're constantly being pummeled by things around them. And it's even more so for these much smaller machines. So basically you should think of these machines as trying to do something useful trying to go somewhere in particular to make something, but constantly jolted, constantly pummeled by their surroundings. So it really is a task that's akin to trying to ride a bicycle in a cyclone. So here's a little fanciful video that's trying to be a little bit more faithful about how bouncy these things are. So basically these machines, they can only do something on average. They take back steps, they take side steps. And so as a result, you can imagine you might build a car engine very differently if every 10th time you put your foot on the gas, it went backwards, right? That just means you have to think differently in how you put it together and how you construct it and how you build around it. It also means that all the connections between the different components of these machines are floppy, right? And that adds another set of challenges, but it turns out it also adds another set of features that can be really useful. Finally, there are no temperature differences that these machines can make use of. If you look at human power plants, what they typically do is they have something that makes something hot, and then they use the temperature difference between, for example, hot steam and say cold exhaust water, the spontaneous energy flow between those, they harness that to generate useful energy. But molecular machines are so small that they can't, they can't maintain temperature differences across their tiny little sizes. So they can't make use of this very generic mechanism for generating energy. Nevertheless, molecular machines can function very impressively. And let me just tell you a couple little anecdotal numbers about these. They can be incredibly efficient. So my favorite machine, ATP synthase, can reach 90% efficiency in converting electrical energy into stored chemical energy. Compare this with your car engine that can only achieve about 20% efficiency. They can move incredibly rapidly. So this bacterial flagellum that spins and makes the bacteria swim, it rotates 300 times a second. That's faster than the turbine engine in a, in a jet airplane. One of these transport motors, myosin, can travel along a filament at about seven micrometers per second. That's very small on our scale, but if you think about it on the terms of the motor, it's 100 body lengths per second. And so that's the equivalent of me running 600 kilometers per hour. Okay, so these can go very, very fast on the scales that they actually operate. And so let me just tell you in the last little minute or so, just very briefly, the kind of research that my group is up to. And so we are theoretical biophysicists. So we scribble on whiteboards and we also program computers to, to do calculations uh, for us. And we ask questions like just kind of what are the fundamental physical limits on what these machines can do? What can we say about what, what's the best they can be in terms of efficiency, accuracy, speed? What kinds of designs for these machines, given the kinds of weird challenges that they face, actually reach these limits? And when we look at what nature has evolved, does it actually match at all these kind of ideas that we as theoretical physicists have? 
has nature in some sense optimized these machines to be really good at these various tasks? And finally, we take these ideas, these sort of design principles that we, that we figure out, and we work with engineers to develop new nanotechnology that kind of makes use of these ideas. So for purposes like more efficient computing, uh, more effective uh, renewable energy like artificial photosynthesis, um, and also you know, drug delivery, more targeted drug delivery. These are all areas that we're sort of talking to people about applications. So I'll just briefly show my group just to give you a feel for who actually does this work. Um, you can see there's a variety of grad students and postdoctoral fellows. I'll highlight in the top left, Tyler, who's a bachelor's uh, student, a second year student who uh, has joined the group through this adopt a physicist program that Levon mentioned. So he just comes to our group meetings and kind of hangs out and soaks up as much as he can. And then who knows, maybe down the road, he'll start doing some uh, research with us. During the summer, we're gonna have three undergraduates coming to work with us doing summer research projects. And we often have undergrads writing uh, honors theses with us as well. And our work, I find very interesting because it's not just physics. We're obviously working in biology and have to learn a lot of that, but we take ideas from math, from computer science, we take engineering insights, we take ideas from chemistry and apply them all in this really interesting, for me, interdisciplinary area. And so if you want to learn a little bit more, I'll just flash up a couple uh, places you can read more. Very accessible, just YouTube videos that show cool movies, books that are at a popular science level, and, and an online book that I particularly like just to kind of see more examples of sort of this quantitative way of thinking about, about life. So with that, I'll stop. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer them. Right, great. Thanks a lot, David. And uh, if any of you missed anything in the talk, would like to come back to it, this will be posted on the website that you used to sign up. So um, also feel free to email us after the event if you come up with any questions. So um, I'll uh, see if there are any, anyone wants to ask a question. We have a couple of minutes. You can um, raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Or if you think of something later, you can just type it in the chat. OK, well, I don't see any raised hands so far. So in the interest of time, I'll move forward. But if something pops in your heads later, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll answer your questions, okay? So um, with that, um, so thanks, David, again. Uh, I'm going to pass to the other David, uh, my other colleague, David Brun, who is also a professor of physics in our department. And as you see in the title of his talk, he is working on superconductivity so David Brun is an experimental physicist, and he, he actually leads a lab. And he, in that lab, he has lots of undergraduate students doing research. So in addition to talking about his research, he's also going to tell us the stories of the students who worked with him. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Dave. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, thanks, Levon. Um, can you see that slide OK? Yeah. OK, great. And you can hear me okay. Yeah. Hey, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to, uh, to host uh, high school students and let them know what's going on at the university. As uh, Levon said, I work on superconductivity. Um, some of you may know a little bit about that. Uh, you know, it's that those materials that lose all their electrical resistance and allow you to uh, levitate magnets. But um, I wanted to say something about research in general, just before um, really getting into the talk. And this is something, you know, I really, I didn't understand at all uh, when I was uh, in high school. And I guess when I just started at, at university, I, I didn't realize that there were so many unsolved problems out there. And so one of, um, one of the very famous physicists, Richard Feynman um, remarked that we're lucky to live in an age in which we're still making discoveries. And that may not always be the case. So um, yeah, it was a big surprise to me to find out just how much is unknown about the world. And research was really the process of uh, 
uncovering the unknown and uh, making sense of it. And it's very easy to be a part of that. And one of the things, as, as Levon has said, that we try to do, um, we, we work very hard to do at SFU Physics, is to get people involved in research at the earliest stage possible. And one of the reasons for that is that there's, there's just nothing more exciting, I think, than seeing some you know, concept that you've been learning in the classroom actually play out in real life and have uh, you know, some, some important uh, application to uncovering knowledge. So we do everything we possibly can to get people involved in, in research. And what I wanna to do today is not so much talk about um, you know, my research, but really show you how uh, undergrads in particular have been a big part of that. So, you know, Levon's shown you that uh, uh, we have a pretty diverse department working on a wide range of problems. So Levon works on uh, cosmology, you know, shown over there on the right uh, is the, uh, uh, is that the, might be the Planck or the WMAP uh, image of the cosmic microwave background. Levon is smiling because he, I'm probably getting that wrong, but that's, it's, you know, that's physics. That a lot it's of Planck. You, it's yeah, Planck. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's physics that a lot of you, you might, might even have heard about uh, in the popular media. You know, everyone wants to, to know about what's going on on the larger scales, you know, what's going on in the universe. Uh, we also have people in the department working on the smaller scales. I don't think we have any string theorists, although uh, Levon, you do a little bit of string theory from time to time, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> But we, we certainly have particle physicists, you know, smashing atoms together and exploring things at the smaller scales. But what I do is happening, it plays out at very ordinary scales. And uh, also, you know, this is the, those are the sorts of scales that uh, people like David Seaback work on as well. So condensed matter physics is concerned with what happens when you put a bunch of atoms together, you know, and create a material, um, an electronic material normally, and uh, you know what makes the electrons do what they do. So, you know we're growing up in a time where well, you guys are growing up. Levon and I and David are already grown up. I think that uh, you know you guys are growing up in a time where you know it almost seems like we have access to infinite computing power. So why don't we just solve all problems by brute force and putting them on a computer? And there's a simple answer to that. As soon as you get down to uh, having to tackle a hard quantum problem, the problem just, you know, gets out of control. It, it, it grows in scale to a, to a size that would, would easily swallow up all the computing power in the world if you really wanted to simulate it. And just to put that in perspective, here is a little sort of very schematic picture of um, of uh, you know the way a condensed matter physicist would think of a collection of uh, atomic sites, so sixteen atoms arranged in a sort of four by four grid. So if you want to simulate that in a computer, you need a matrix, which is four to the power of sixteen by four to the power of sixteen in size. So four to the power of sixteen is about four billion. That's about the largest system you can solve exactly. The largest sort of um, you know, quantum system you can solve to understand uh, how the electrons behave. So brute force is just a, a non-starter. But the nice thing about that is it means that nature has a lot of surprises in store for us. And so I work closely with, uh, with people that grow materials. They put different types of atoms together to make materials. Um, and you can, you can sort of look to see some of the surprises that emerge when you make your materials more and more complex. So if you, um, if you were just to make materials out of a single element, well, we know there are about a hundred of those. The periodic table has about a hundred elements. And so what we learned from that maybe is, uh, you know, we learned if the physics of hydrogen, that's already pretty interesting. Um, sorry, that was, that was hundred to the power of zero. Yeah, so one, hydrogen is the zero thought of problem. Niobium is an element that we, um, you know, pick out of the periodic table and it's a pretty good superconductor. So a lot was learned about superconductivity just by looking at uh, elemental materials. Now you can see a piece of, uh, I think it's a magnet levitating over a piece of niobium. Okay, um, if you start making compounds, you know, out of two elements at a time, then you get to things like gallium arsenide. That's important in electronics, but it's all 
uh, it's also somewhere where physicists have discovered all sorts of new physics going on at low temperatures. One example of that is something you know, fairly complicated called the fractional quantum hall effect. Perhaps all you need to know about that is that uh, um, in that regime, the electrons behave as though they've broken up into particles that carry one third of the electronic charge. Now, if you start making uh, more and more complicated alloys, you get to things, some of the things that I study, heavy electron materials. In this case, uh, these are like regular metals, but the, the, um, the electrons behave as though they are 100 to 1,000 times heavier than regular electrons. And if you start making more complicated compounds, um, you get things like high temperature superconductors, um, which are really very interesting indeed, and it's still a, a, an open problem. And uh, if you keep on going beyond that, you start to get into the regime that uh, David Seebach uh, explores. We have biology, life, and ultimately intelligence. And so what we're seeing here is that in addition to there being an axis that just describes scale, there's a completely different axis and it's complexity. And out of complexity emerges all sorts of interesting things. And so condensed matter physicists are interested in that emergence and they're interested in all of those discoveries. So what I work on in particular is superconductivity. Um, this is just a, a very schematic picture of the, the two most famous properties. So when you cool down a superconductor, the resistivity suddenly drops to zero at some critical temperature Tc. Below that temperature as well, superconductors tend to uh, levitate above, uh, above magnets. And that's because, well, in part because they expel magnetic fields, also because they're, they're typically very good at trapping magnetic fields in a dissipationless way. So these are the things that my group studies at low temperatures. So one of the aspects of superconductivity that we like to study is, uh, is to do with uh, the way superconductors operate. So superconductors uh, become superconducting by forming pairs of electrons. So those electrons have to overcome their mutual repulsion and traditional superconductors do that by polarizing the lattice. So one electron moves through the lattice, attracts the positive ion cores towards it. The first electron moves away, the second electron um, uh, gets attracted to that, uh, that sort of positive wake that the first electron leaves behind. A more sophisticated way of looking at that with, that we learn about in physics is that one electron talks to the other electron by exchanging a sound wave. So in physics, a quantized sound wave is something we call a phonon. So the, the, uh, the electrons talk to each other by exchanging these lattice vibrations. And what we've learned um, in the last little while is it's also possible for electrons to communicate like this and form Cooper pairs and become superconducting by exchanging um, magnetic uh, fluctuations. So a magnetic wave these magnetic waves can lead to much stronger types of pairing and we can get to higher and higher transition temperatures. So just to give you an idea of, you know, why this is or how this is still a, a very dynamic area, um, the materials that uh, I guess I spent a lot of time studying when I was a graduate student and then beyond that with the high temperature superconductors, those got up to a record transition temperature of about 160 Kelvin, but that's still, you know, a good, uh, good 140 odd Kelvin below room temperature. We've seen other families actually, you know, every few years, there's a, a discovery of a, a, new, um, a new family of superconductors. And what's been seen in the last little while is superconductors where the TC is approaching room temperature and possibly even reaching room temperature. Well, that, that remains a bit of a controversial result. And so uh, these are the materials shown in the top right, and they're all um, compounds that have a lot of hydrogen in them. So they're made of very, very light atoms. And the only drawback there is that you have to squeeze them to immense pressures of the order of millions of atmospheres in order to, uh, to get them to become superconductors. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very dynamical field and there's, there's always, uh, there are always new discoveries being made. So another thing I just wanted to touch on before talking about some of the student research is that uh, one of the things that makes uh, physics so attractive is that um, we seem to live in a universe that can be described using mathematics, and in particular, the mathematics of waves, superpositions of waves. But um, 
uh, if you go on and study more physics, this is one of the very pleasing things that you'll see. Over and over again, the same type of wave behavior shows up in many different contexts. And some of these you're already really familiar with, water waves, sound waves. Some of them you're probably learning about now, electromagnetic waves, such as light or uh, the microwave frequencies that we use. But there are also electron waves. These make up uh, quantum mechanics and things like gravitational waves, um, which are you know, really, really uh, important to the sort of physics that people like Levon study. So what I want to talk to you about in the last little while is the fact that we use, what we do primarily in our group is we use electromagnetic waves to study electron waves in some sense. And the technique that we use to do that is something called resonator perturbation. So um, sounds a bit complicated, but I think it's something that you guys already know um, a great deal about. So you all know that uh, if, you, if you take a guitar and you, you know, increase the tension in a string, for instance, then you'll increase the frequency of the note. You'll increase the pitch of the note. Similarly, if you, if you take one of those guitar strings and you shorten it by, by pressing on it um, with your finger, then you'll also change the pitch of the note. And so the frequency of a resonance responds in a sort of gradual way to the perturbations that we apply to it. And resonators are everywhere. So here is an example of another resonator that people are probably familiar with. This is a bell. This is actually the Liberty Bell. And you can see that uh, actually quite a big perturbation has been made to it at some point in time. And that would certainly change its frequency. Now, what we do in our lab, as I said before, is we want to use electromagnetic waves to study the electrons in these superconductors. So the type of resonator that we use, it's not a mechanical resonator like the guitar or the the bell, it's an electromagnetic resonator that we, uh, uh, that we get, that we form um, basically by, by trapping microwave frequency light inside some sort of enclosure. And some of these enclosures can be a little bit complicated. But really, uh, in a lot of ways, that's just a fancy way of saying that uh, we make these little miniature microwave ovens. Okay, so microwave oven works in a very similar way, has a metallic enclosure, Set, we set up some sort of standing wave pattern of the electromagnetic field. Um, I introduce a superconductor into the microwave. Maybe someone else introduces uh, you know, a cup of coffee that's, uh, that needs reheating. And what we look for in this case, you know, just like someone listening to a guitar, we look for a change in the frequency of the resonance. Okay, so if we push a sample into the, uh, the, uh, the resonator, we might see the frequency go up. And the other thing we can do, and I guess it will be a little bit like putting the crack in this bell, um, if we introduce something that has dissipation, then it, uh, it uh, introduces uh, loss. So it makes the, uh, the resonance sort of broader. It doesn't, if you were to watch it as a function of time, it would die away faster. But it'd be a, a little bit like, say, taking a guitar string, you know, and leaving your finger um, touching one of the strings, you would deaden the sound. So we're looking at both of those effects in a, in a very sensitive way. Okay, so what I wanted to do is just highlight some of the things that undergrad students have done uh, in the group. The, the first undergrad student um, is Paul Carrier. Um, when he was in a group, it was part of his engineering physics program. He was an absolutely fantastic student. Um, one of the reason, uh, one of the ways you can tell if someone uh, did a really great honors thesis is that the, uh, the PhD students in your group still use the honors thesis as a reference guide a decade later. Okay, so Paul Carrier did a thesis like that. So he, he was the first person to really work out how to simulate these complicated dielectric resonators numerically um, using finite element. And uh, this just shows at the bottom there some of the standing wave patterns you can get. And once he'd done that, other students in the group were able to, uh, to put that resonator system to work to study um, properties of, uh, of uh, um, things like organic superconductors. So a student called Sonia Milbrat used that uh, for these uh, um, you know, complicated uh, superconductors that are built out of combinations of uh, organic molecules and uh, um, various uh, cations and anions. And this shows some of the data she was able to take 
you can see there that goes down to quite a low temperature. I guess lowest data point was about 50 milli degrees above uh, absolute zero. And uh, she got some very convincing evidence that this particular type of superconductor um, had Cooper pairs that were formed by the exchange of those magnetic fluctuations. So again, I'm just moving on fairly quickly here. We had another really great honors student uh, come into the group, a guy called Eric Thewalt. Um, and he took some of the ideas that uh, Paul Carrier had set up and he carried out a, a very careful, very well thought out and then very well executed design of a similar dielectric resonator that improved upon a whole bunch of things, but it allowed us to, to do these very sensitive measurements in extremely strong magnetic fields. So the, the magnet is not shown here, but this is a cutaway of his entire apparatus. Again, this was mounted below one of these dilution refrigerators that gets to very low temperature. And um, um, yeah, so this whole thing inserts inside uh, a big solenoid that cre can create a magnetic field of nine Tesla. And then another student uh, uh, followed on from that. And you can see the student's work tends to build on other students' work. This was Natalie Murphy and uh, she did a bunch of things, but um, one of her main projects was to uh, study what happens when you take a superconductor and you apply a very strong magnetic field. It turns out that the magnetic field enters the sample as a whole bunch of uh, superconducting vortices. So these are very similar to the, uh, let's say the little whirlpools that would form around a drain in your bathtub. So you have some sort of core to the vortex and around that you have a whole bunch of supercurrents swirling around. And so she was studying the behavior of these vortices um, um, in the presence of uh, uh, these, these microwave fields. And this shows the big magnet that went around Eric Thewalt's uh, apparatus. And this just shows a little bit of her data going down to, uh, going down to low temperatures. And I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, so the contribution Natalie Murphy made here by extending um, some of the data we'd already measured down to low temperatures made the difference and uh, let us publish these re uh, results in the top uh, physics journal, physic, uh, physical review letters. So um, that was a great contribution. And I just wanted to finish off <clears throat> by playing this video. And I, I, hope, um, I hope the resolution is okay uh, via Zoom. So this is just a, a sort of sped up version of uh, a video that one of the undergrads in our lab made just to show, to give a, a, a nice sort of tour of the inside of our apparatus. So you can see here, this is a, this is a much tidier version. Our lab looks, well, if we really tidied up our lab, it would look just like this in the picture. It shows a dilution refrigerator system, you know, gas handling system on the right, a big electronics rack on, on the left. If you don't believe me, you're very welcome to come and visit SFU one day and see that uh, this is a, a very, very uh, faithful scale rendering. This is a low temperature cryostat. You can see some helium in there, that big magnet down the bottom, the dilution refrigerator down the middle. And one of the innovations we put in there, which is a, a built-in helium reliquifier. I'll just let that play again. And this shows the process of inserting a sample uh, from room temperature into that uh, experiment um, in vacuum without having to warm the experiment up. And, this, and these, these are all things that students in the group um, sort of set up and built for us over the years. And uh, you know, the reason why we're able to do all the things we, we can do in the way of uh, uh, sophisticated measurements. So yeah, this is a very sped up version because I know we're on a clock here and that shows the, uh, the, the sample being plugged into the lowest temperature stage inside that dielectric resonator that was uh, designed by Eric Thewalt. So um, Levon, I think that uh, brings me to the end. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave, that was great. Um... We have a couple of minutes for questions before we move on to the questions by uh, to the student panel. So any questions for Dave or about the previous talk, even though the speaker left, uh, David Sivak, but I could try to answer, or Dave, David Brun and I could try. So any questions to our professor speakers? Okay. So it, no worries if questions come to you later, uh, please type them in the chat or raise your hand. I've just thought of a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if you'll remember, but do you know what was used to make that animation? 
I can I could find out for you. Um, just uh, like give Lab on your uh, email address. I, there's a little bit of a story to it. It was a serious piece of serious piece of software. Um, the background story is another one of the undergrads was a, a system admin for a company that had its servers located in uh, Costa Rica. And uh, I can't really say what the business that company was in, but there was a reason why the service had to be offshore. And for security reasons, they had to keep a complete backup server that they never used. So we used um, a month of runtime on that server in order to do the, uh, the rendering. But uh, I'd have to, I don't know, if, if you know some names, I, I might recognize it, um, the, the software. Uh, anything come to mind? Blender. No, not Blender. Uh, <laughs> not Blender. Anyway, okay. uh, the other thing, I guess, with our students, they're um, endlessly resourceful. Yeah. Yeah, I can attest to that. Yeah, and that's, so, that's what we love about working with them. Yeah. Um, so um, let's uh, move on to the next item on our schedule, which is a student panel. So we'd like it to have, I see five students. That's great. Uh, so can, if you turn your cameras on and they are uh, students ranging from a first year student, at least one that I know, to uh, more senior students. And one of the students is actually an engineering physics student, which is in uh, more diversity. So great. So let's uh, start. And uh, uh, but how about we start with very short introductions, if, if you don't mind, guys, just um, let's go from Julia, Elias, uh, Sharik, Hamish, Zachary, Elliot. OK, so that's how you are on my screen. So just say what year you are and what your name and your and what you do. Okay, go ahead. Hello, my name is Julia. I'm the first year mathematical physics honors student in the panel. So I still vaguely remember how it was to get into this program, what the requirements were. Um, I also know the new student experience. So if you've got any questions about that, direct them at me. Anyway, it's nice to meet you all. Okay. It is. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Elias. Elias. I'm a fourth year and I am in engineering physics. So it's a bit of a combination of engineering and physics. So yeah, that's sort of, yeah. Okay. Sharik. Yeah. I can't hear you. I always forget to pull this down. It's it's okay. uh, that's fine. Um, all right, I'm Sharik. I'm uh, I'm in my fifth slash sixth year. I'm uh, hopefully almost done, and uh, I'm in the mathematical physics program. Okay. Yeah, Hamish. Hello, my name is Hamish. I'm a third year physics student, and I'm not sure exactly what the specialty I'll be going into, but physics for now. Okay. Zachary. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm a fifth slash fifth year undergrad slash first year master's student here at SFU. Um, in applied physics, and now uh, just physics as masters. So hello. Okay. Thanks. Elliot. Hey, I'm Elliot. I'm a fourth year physics major, and I'm mostly interested in nuclear science. Okay. So why don't we open the floor? Let's see if there are any questions from the audience. You, you could ask them about anything, like what it's like. What, uh, what they want to do in the future, what their career, uh, what, um, what their experience at SFU has been, and anything else. I will not interfere.
me ask a question. Nobody has one yet. I see. Oh, no, a there's couple a couple of in the chat. I'll wait. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start with uh, can you all see uh, panelists? Can you all see the questions? Um, you are welcome to volunteer uh, to go. Just go ahead and answer. So I'll I'll just kick us off. I'll mm -hmm. answer first one. What career path are you guys planning on going to? That's uh that's a bit of a loaded question. It's a good question. Currently, I don't know. Uh, one thing I do know is that after I graduate with my bachelor's degree, I plan on working in industry, uh, wherever that might lead me. So there's there's always options for what kind of work I might do. Uh, after taking a few courses, I know what I don't want to do, but I'm still definitely open to what possibilities there are. Great, thank, thanks. Any Anyone else wants to? Yeah, go ahead. If uh, I don't know who wants to answer, so if you want to answer, maybe panelists could uh, raise a hand or just show a hand. Yeah, Julia, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, to follow up on that, I think Elias made a very good point, which is that uh, by entering this program, you get to learn as well as what you want to do, what you don't want to do. Uh, it gives you a much clearer idea of what you are going to aim for in your future career. Like, I, I generally that I was into research, and then I discovered that uh, I find it really hard to spend four hours in a lab with no windows sometimes. And therefore, I've been considering my options like communication. So writing in education. So there's a lot of interesting things to. Um, thanks, Julian. Um, we had a bit of trouble with your sound. Um, maybe just for future answers, can you just double check your connection? So maybe anyone else wants to say what the uh, future career choice would be? Yeah, Hamish? I'll just add in before Shriek. Um, I think one of the great things about physics is that it's quite open-ended. Um, and my favorite thing about the physics department is that they offer weekly colloquiums where um, guest speakers from other universities doing research or people from industry or professors at SFU give a talk every week on different subjects. And it's an interesting way to learn more about what's going on in industry or in research. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Sharik. So I think there's this kind of related to like another question as to like um, someone asked if we'd done co-op before. So last summer, I actually got the opportunity to um, work at Triumph for about four months. And I kind of came out of that after knowing like, oh, this is something I could really look forward to doing in the future. Um, so with regards to like figuring out what to do, like the other said, you kind of don't know. And it's just kind of where you put yourself and kind of what you try to do that'll help you determine it. I don't think I would have been as solid as to like wanting to go into research if I hadn't done the four months last year, actually getting that experience. Okay, thank you. I, I have, I, I see two questions that we could take turns answering. You can answer them together. So one question is, when did you know you wanted to study physics? And the other one is, did you take the uh, AP physics in high school. So feel free to answer both in one go as we take turns. Yeah, Elliot, go ahead. Uh, I, I kind of figured it out pretty late. Uh, I think I was in grade 12 when I decided on it and my school didn't even offer AP physics. So if you haven't taken AP physics, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I, I think you'll be good. Thanks, yeah, Zachary. Uh, actually similar to Elliot. Uh, I didn't decide I wanted to do physics until actually grade 12. Uh, before that, I was actually going to go into culinary arts. Uh, yeah. But I, I did take um, IB physics uh, in grade 11 and 12, and they got me to do like my own kind of a technical report, you'd call it, where you had to come up with your own experiment and do some analysis, and that got me really excited about it. Uh, and I heard from a couple of friends that that's kind of what goes on in physics, so I kind of decided to pursue that. 
for my undergrad. Yeah, great, thank you. Hamish? Um, I also didn't realize until quite late. I knew in high school I wanted to pursue science and they didn't offer AP physics. But sometime in grade 12, I kind of compared the options between computer science, math, engineering, and physics. And physics is a very good middle ground that can then be applied in any of those areas pretty well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Julian? Oh, we don't have sound. Um, sorry, that's disappointing. You had it before, but at some point, let's go with Ed, uh, Elias and Julian, you connect after that, okay? Let's, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So uh, what's interesting, uh, like I said, I'm in engineering physics, so I actually started off my program in the School of Engineering Science. And so I only had to pick that I was going into physics in my second year of university. I always knew it was kind of the stream that I was going to pick. I, I just had extra time to take classes and find out what I was going to do. The one thing I will also say is uh, I'm finding often some of the older students at school they, they, they choose what, they, what really interests them later on in their careers. I still will have colleagues that, are, that took gap years and found out what they wanted to do. So I don't think there's any pressure to know exactly what type of physics you want to do uh, right out of the gate. And I didn't take AP physics. That was also not offered at my school. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see, uh, Julian, do you want to go ahead now? Third time's a charm, hopefully. Good. Oh, thank, thank the Lord. Okay, I just wanted to say I did take AP physics in high school. It was offered at my school, but I wouldn't say that that was what mainly inspired me to take physics in university. I kind of enjoyed school physics averagely, but I really got interested when I started taking out books from the library on various related subjects and found out that, that it really interested me. Because sometimes like while Newton's second law is like, okay, when you start reading about kind of the great research of the past, it's a bit more interesting. Thank you. Uh, is that a raised hand, Hamish? Did, okay then you can lower it. Okay, great, thanks. So um, there was a question earlier that one of you answered, but maybe the others can too. Has any of you uh, taken uh, or made use of the code? And if not, what maybe you can say, what, um, in what way were you involved in research if you were? Yeah, Elliot? Uh, I haven't done co-op, but I did the Adopt a physicist and a USRA, and both of those are pretty positive experiences, and I would, I definitely recommend them. And it's actually, you should talk to professors more than you would think. They're quite happy to have you come work for them. They really do like free labor. Thank you. Yeah, Zach. Uh, once again, uh, sorry, uh, Elliot. Uh, kind of the same story. Uh. I didn't do co-op. I attempted to, but I found that um, NSERC was more interesting to me because I actually got to go work directly with physics related stuff and do research with a professor at SFU. And that actually led me on eventually to start my master's program because I just found the topic of um, solid state so interesting. Which, sorry, that, that's what I'm doing. So yeah. anyways, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Hamish? Um, so I did enroll in the co-op program, which basically involves spending a total of at least three semesters working in industry or in a lab in some way. I worked over last summer in one of the engineering labs in Surrey, which was interesting, kind of a little different from physics, um, but still very similar experimental lab work. And um, I got it interested in experimental work by joining the Adopt a Physicist program, much like uh, Zach and Elliot. And it's hopefully, or it has led to the summer I'll be working in that, in the lab that I was adopted by um, through an NSERT award. 
which as I think they've made it now where you have to fill out some extra forms, but an NSERC term can count towards a co-op term as well. Okay, thanks. Is that um, hand, uh, Elias? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I have to do co-op and I have done two terms and I'm gonna be doing my third term this summer. My first two terms were at a fuel cell company and this third term I'm doing with a uh, particle physics prof at SFU. So I'll be doing research. I think uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to get some experience, learn how to write resume, learn how to write cover letter. So there's, there's definitely lots of bonuses. Okay. Yeah, Sharik. Oh, I just figured I'd maybe just explain what the NSERC and the USRA is just because I don't know if everyone knows that. Yeah. Um, um, so just for some context, the NSERCs and the USRAs are, they're basically projects that profs post um, sort of in January-ish, I believe. Lamont, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. But, uh, and they basically are like specialized projects for students to undergo. So maybe you'll be running a specific model all summer where you'll be helping design a specific piece of tech. It really varies in terms of projects and you can kind of pick and choose to apply. They're all like funded. So you get paid to do the research over the summer. Um, and yeah, just a whole bunch of different opportunities. I think most places in science offer some sort of NSERC or USRA and sort of like different projects. Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, um, I don't see any new questions. Are there any other questions people want to ask maybe about what, uh, what it's like socially? Uh, I don't want to be asking the questions because I'm obviously biased. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question, is it more hands-on projects, labs, or more paperwork? There's a question from Rachel. Any takers? I'm just wondering. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Hamish. I was just wondering if it was more in the context of um, research work or in classes. What do you mean, Rachel? Do you mean for research? Both. I think it can be both in both ways. In in classes, there are, there's a lot of quantitative um, physics-based courses, but there are also some written courses that you have to complete. Um, as well as lab courses. And in, in research, it goes the same way. There can be more theoretical and more applied pathways. Uh, Julian, did you want to comment? And then we have uh, another question, but yeah, Julian, go ahead. Yeah, I could cover the class one. So your classes will be mostly quantitative. So any homework, et cetera, will be mostly crunching numbers or trying to chug out and integrate formulas and whatnot, at least in your first year, once again, speaking from my experience. And yes, there will be a lot of labs. For my program, you have to take a lab every semester for like about the first three years, I think. Um, and I think you only have to complete like one or two written courses in the entirety of your like undergrad. So it's not very much writing class-wise, I'd say. So there is a, another question. Does SFU Physics have any summer programs for high school students? I don't know if, if the students know about that. Do you know uh, anyone? I'm struggling to uh, uh, answer. I, I don't think I'm aware of um, summer programs. So maybe we have um, Claire and Cynthia, maybe you are aware, uh, I don't know. We, ha we certainly have an occasional high school student do research. I worked with two high school students myself, not just over the summer, but actually since she was before high school and then she became a high school student and now she's at university. But um, at the different, she's at Princeton now. So it was informal, 
she just did a research project with me over the years, but I don't know of any like organized programs. Do you know, Claire? Yeah, and perhaps Cynthia is able to pop on since it's a little bit more uh, in her wheelhouse or she can write in the chat, but uh, there is a program at SFU called Science in Action, which is for our current SFU students to connect with um, students. It's quite the range. It's like K to 12 in terms of uh, doing science outreach programming. Um, so I will pop my email in the chat. If you want to follow up with me, I can definitely connect you with Cynthia and that group uh, for sure. Great. Thanks, Claire. And I will add to that. Thank you, Claire. Um, we all, aside from a uh, science in action, there is also another program named Let's Talk Science, and they do um, all these summer camps and summer activities. And I know there's all there's always a uh, call out for high school students to volunteer for these summer activities. Um, so if you just Google SFU Let's Talk Science, it should come up under uh, uh, the volunteer page. Great. Thanks. Thank you.